Thank you for coming <clears throat> for coming out to uh, to hear this. I um, the face of imperialism is a book about how to think about imperialism, and it's a desperate need. It's a desperate need. You can see it today. Our people are so utterly confused by what's happening in Libya. They're standing shoulder to shoulder with the CIA and the Pentagon and the White House on Libya. They're standing shoulder to shoulder with these White House and these guys on Syria and the like. And um, <clears throat> so I wanted to talk about how to think about it and how people have been thinking about it. I wrote a book years ago, uh, some years ago, seven, eight years ago, uh, called um, The Assassination of Julius Caesar. It was about the Roman Empire. And I got to read a lot of literature on empire. And it struck me that the literature on empire, both more recent and also uh, that pertaining to ancient times, looked upon empires as rather favorably. It also occurred to me that was true about movies, too. Have you seen all those movies of the guys in togas and say, but Rome, Rome shall prevail. And we're all sitting there going, yeah, Rome, oh, Rome. And, uh, and Rome, was a, Rome was a bunch of butchers and thieves and, and plunderers and, and the like. But, uh, or the British Empire, you know, um, they were looked at pretty nicely. Now, despite this, despite that sympathetic treatment accorded to empires, they were seen as things, forces that brought order to these squabbling uh, backward tribes and all that, built roads, you know, and aqueducts, and did this, and trade, and all that sort of thing. So empires were something that was supposed to be pretty good. Nevertheless, America didn't have an empire. That was something else I learned. Uh, you didn't talk about an American empire. Jefferson did. Washington did. In the early days, they talked about how we're going to build our own empire here in the Western Hemisphere and all that, uh, and, cr and across the continent. But, uh, but by the 1920s, 30s, 40s, all sorts of countries had empires. The British had an empire. The French had an empire. The Dutch in the uh, East Indies had an empire. The Soviet empire, the most sinister and relentless and horrible of all, of course. Um, but America, we just had territories and possessions. And we would give them independence, too. So that was very nice. So when I wrote my book in 1995, before the, before the Roman book, the, before the Julius Caesar book, I wrote a book called Against Empire, and I meant the American Empire. People said, isn't that a bit much, an American empire? I mean, we had a foreign policy. We didn't have an empire. But by 2000, with it less than five years later, there was a whole rack of books coming out, and everybody was using the word empire. Everybody was saying it's an American empire or U.S. empire. They were... They were entitling their books with titles like Sorrows of Empire, Follies of Empire, Twilight of Empire, Empire of Illusions. Um, one professor writing in Harvard Magazine, unequivocal about this country's force majeure role in the world. We were a force majeure, the great, the major force power. We, quote, we are militarily dominant around the world unapologetic about that. Didn't feel he had to explain that. He was stating it proudly. A political unit that has overwhelming superiority of military power and uses that power to influence the behavior of other states is called an empire. Our goal is not combating a rival, but maintaining our supreme imperial position and maintaining imperial order. Hello? I mean, who's this Colonel Blimp? Who's the... Uh, uh, where was... I mean, where was this published? In uh, um, Rupert's Murdoch Wall Street Journal? No, it was in Harvard Magazine. Well, what do you know? And then there was a whole crop of liberal publications. In fact, some of those titles I mentioned to you were, were liberal writers like 
like uh, Chris Hedges or Cha Chalmers Johnson, especially Chalmers Johnson, he led the charge on all of this. And the charge was to criticize the empire, but never criticize it in the way that it was really happening. Criticize the empire because the people who were building this empire, the people who owned most of the world, the people who destroyed whole countries and walked away fabulously rich, the people who, who developed new means of undermining any kind of independence anywhere in the world, these people were stupid. They weren't as smart as, the, as those of us stuck away at various universities who were writing these little books like Chalmers Johnson. And so we got critical analyses of American policy, but the criticism was always about how confused our policymakers were. The liberal critics are never happier than when they can rock back on their heels and say how confused these leaders are, how stupid Ronald Reagan was, he misused words, how stupid George Bush was, he mispronounced words, and, and therefore that proves he didn't know what he was doing. And I, and I did a little gathering of the adjectives they used from these various books I mentioned, and I have a whole fat footnote in here, I'm not going to re read the citations of all the sources. But Chalmers Johnson's and those people, and this is what, and th they talked about their critiques of U.S. empire characterized U.S. interventionist policies as, quote, these are all quoted words, reckless, misguided, inept, bumbling, insensitive, overreaching, self-deceptive, deluded, driven by false assumptions, and presuming a mandate from God. They were laden, this, this policy was laden with, quote, tragic mistakes, an imperial hubris. You see, it was hubris. That's what it was. Just uh, that means arrogance. Um, <clears> or <throat> well, they saw this as a a mindless proclivity embedded in the American psyche or culture. Excuse me. <clears throat> well. I want to argue, and I did argue in this book, and I think I showed it, that empire is not just something that's done because people are overambitious or misguided or inept, or they don't have your guidance, uh, Chalmers Johnson's, because you're so much smarter than, than all those guys are. Um, I argued that the empire isn't for power for power's sake. Oh, that's another critique. That was Johnson's critique, too. And that's a critique that they often make, which is that uh, these people g get intoxicated with power. They want to get more, and they want to extend American power this far, and then they want to extend it that far because they just are. Uh, uh, they, they just want power for power's sake. It's not power for power's sake. It's imperialism. The empire does imperialism. That's the process of empire, and imperialism is more than just aggrandizing for the sake of aggrandizing. Even back, even back among the conquistadores, back in the in the 16th century, and 17th century, it was, it was God, and glory. That's the power. That's the that's the glory. And but then don't forget the most important of the three G's, which was what, gold. gold. Yeah, God, glory, and gold. Excuse me, put it in the correct order, would you guys? But, um, gold, God, no glory. Th there are real material interests at stake. There are fortunes to be made many times over. C behind Colonel Blimp there stood the East India Company and the Bank of England in India. Behind Teddy Roosevelt and the U.S. Marines there stood the United Fruit Company and Wall Street. The intervention is intended to enrich the investors and keep the world safe for their system for their system of investment, their system of expropriation, their system of trade, their system of misusing labor, and, and the like. <coughs> so that's what I say. Now, you don't have to take my word for it, because the rest of the book splendidly argues and demonstrates and shows you how that happens. Among the plundered populations, there used to be a term used. It was called the resource curse. In fact, the American Indians used to have a saying, 
if on your reservoir, that bleak, desolate reservoir they threw all your people on, the one that none of the farmers wanted to use or plunder and there's nothing left on it, it's now your reservoir. If on that reservoir you're digging one day and you discover oil, stamp it down, bury it down, get some, uh -huh. get gravel sand and, and smother it down. If there's oil on your reservoir, that's the end of your reservoir. It's not yours anymore. It, the white man will come in and say, oh, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute, we got a little mistake here on the deed. This land really belongs to uh, the such and such. That's called a resource curse. That is, you had nations that had, were relatively sparse in their resources going to places that were relatively rich. They went into Africa and they carved it up. Who carved up Africa? I'll tell you who. The French, the Portuguese, the Germans, the Italians, and most of all, the Brits. Um, and you can talk about Asia, the same gang, the same group, and Latin America, the same. There you gotta put the Americans in, the US. Um, they went to these places because these, these nations, these continents are rich. You don't go to poor countries, you go to rich countries. And you go in there, and I love to always uh, list some of these things. I never get a complete list. But here, here's what you do. You go in there and you, I, I, I'll read this thing. For centuries, the ruling interests in Western Europe, and later on North America and Japan, laid claim to most of planet Earth, including the labor of indigenous peoples as workers or slaves, their incomes, through colonial taxation or debt control or other means, their markets and the abundant treasures of their lands. And what were the abundant treasures? Gold, silver, diamonds, slaves, copper, rum, molasses, hemp, flax, ebony, timber, sugar, fruits. You don't want to have me mention every fruit, you know. To, uh, tobacco, palm oil, ivory, iron, tin, nickel, coal, cotton, corn, and more recently, uranium, manganese, titanium, bauxite, oil. Let's say that one again, oil. So this is what it was all about. That was the resource curse, that um, if your land was rich, God pity you, because the plunderers would come in and they would impoverish you. And the other thing they would do, the other thing that empires do, the other thing that imperialism does, which is never mentioned, by the way, in, in much of literature, is that they kill enormous numbers of people. I mean, they kill hundreds of thousands. They kill millions. Uh, Mike Davis has a book called The Victorian Holocaust. He talks about the millions who were killed by British imperialism and European imperialism. Uh, many parts of the world. We, we saw that in our lifetime. Vietnam. I mean, Vietnam. Half a million, oh, a million and a half Vietnamese killed. 185,000 South Vietnamese soldiers. 924,000 North Vietnamese and Viet Cong soldiers. 415,000 additional civilians. Probably higher than that. Uh, they're, they're less likely to get a count and 58,000 American troops. Um, so killing is a really big part of it. <clears throat> so the face of imperialism reveals an endless carnage and an endless slaughter, parading under the flag of humanitarian intervention or um, protecting the rights of a minority ethnic group in the area. Or, as George Herbert Walker Bush, when he went into Somalia, to help them with their famine. I mean, wasn't that a funny one? George Herbert Walker Bush, Skull and Bones, Yale, CIA, U.S. Navy, Vice President, Senate, U.S. Senator, Vice President, then President of the United States, concerned about, about, about a, a famine in Somalia. There was a famine going on that very year in about 11 Ara uh, African countries. He didn't, show, he didn't show the slightest interest in any one of those countries, but Somalia, he went in where they had just done all this prospecting and said three-fourths of this country has oil under it, rich oil reserves. And suddenly, 
George Herbert Walker Bush was moved in his heart <laughs> to go into Mogadishu and kill a lot of people to set them straight because they weren't, didn't understand this was a humanitarian mission. How do you make these people understand? You just level, you just level the guns at them when they start getting too close. So, so this is, this is the dominant paradigm. And the, these kinds of interventions are the 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 carnage is never mentioned. Instead, we got to keep in mind these are the terms that are used when you go to college and when you go to graduate school and the like. These are the terms that they use to describe all this: foreign policy, international relations, overseas commitments, regime change, and intervention. Uh, and that's a that's the way it is. Do the people who put forth the lies of empire, do they believe what they tell us? Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. Sometimes they sincerely think they're doing a good thing, like they're stopping communism and that's better for everybody. And, like. and sometimes you could see they are in the most hypocritical contradictions. And I deal with any number of them in, in the book. Um, now, it's not only resource acquisition. It's not only going into these countries for the oil and the, and the cotton and the iron and, the, and this and that and the other thing. Um, Ronald Reagan went into Grenada. Remember? The little yeah. island of Grenada. 102,000 people he sent to force in and invaded and took over Grenada. It was in the hands of a revolutionary movement that was now... Uh, communalizing the land, setting up uh, farm communes, uh, public health programs, and all sort of things. That had to be stopped. Ronald Reagan went in and he said, this intervention is not about nutmeg. You know, he was a very smart guy. As the liberals all rocked back on their heels and chuckled about how stupid Ronald Reagan is and how, how stupid American foreign policy is. We always get in, we always back the wrong guys. Why are we always backing the wrong guys? Because you're stupid to never ask the question, what, what makes you think they're the wrong guys for the guys up there at the top? Maybe they're the right guys. Maybe you should start opening your mind a little more critically. And Ronald Reagan was, was hinting at something really at the heart of the matter. It wasn't a resource allocation. We didn't need Grenadian nutmeg. We can get perfectly good nutmeg from Africa, for God's sake. And anyway, what, Grenada's going to bring us to our knees by cutting off our nutmeg <laughs> supply? <laughs> he said that he was absolutely right. What he was doing, what he was doing was serving notice to every nation in the Caribbean that if you chart this revolutionary course like the New Jewel Movement did in Grenada. This is what's going to happen to you. We are going to come down on your neck and we will put you straight. And those communal farms have been reconverted to golf courses in Grenada. And the tourist industry is back and the poverty is back even more. The same with Pan Panama under Noriega. We will show you, you try to change this, you try to open up opportunities, you try to expand your middle class, you try to lift your, 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 your wage earnings, you try to increase your social wage, you try to expand your social services, you do those kind of things, you try to turn this into a social democracy instead of a cheap third world country that's open to us, that we can mess you over any way we want. You try to get out of that rope and we will come down on you so hard and you'll never forget it. And if we have to kill 20,000 of you, or 50,000, or 80,000, we're prepared to do it. You got the message, capiche? You understand? And that's the issue. That's what's going on. That's what's happening in Libya right now. They're being, ta they're being told that you are out of line. It's not that oil. They, the French companies can get that oil. The Italian companies, the U.S. companies even could get that oil. But... Um, but in fact, it's to keep these countries in line. The empire has only two kinds of countries beyond its border. The empire sees only two kinds. One are satellites, vassal states that obey, that throw themselves open to the U.S. And the other are enemies or potential enemies. Any sign of independence, any sign of self-development, 
any sign of, of um, self-preference is taken as a sign of developing a regional power. The American people can't get frightened. You can't frighten them by saying, Iraq, Iraq may really take us down. But you could say, Iraq is developing as a regional power. So, in other words, they'll take this whole region and turn it against us. We, you may not get any gas for your cars or fuel for your houses anymore. You never know. And meanwhile, those countries are all begging to sell to the American market. There isn't a country, Cuba with its sugar, Iraq with its oil, they're all begging to sell and, and get into the American market. In fact, the Gulf War, the Gulf War of 19, when was that, 90, 91? What? 91. The Gulf War was about Saddam Hussein wanting a larger quota of the market, wanting to sell oil, and I saw it right in the Washington Post business section. Iraqi oil may jeopardize prices. In other words, too much oil may come in, uh, too much. And, and, and George Herbert Walker Bush was saying no. And, and, uh, and Osama, uh, um, Saddam Hussein was saying, there, was saying there are different forms of aggression. There are different forms of aggression, and we, and we are being faced by this. Uh, we're getting cut off, and we're, we have no market for our, our top quality crude. So, so that's, what, that's what it's about. It's not only about resource acquisition, it's about keeping the entire globe safe. It's about taking any country that wants to use its land, labor, natural resources, and its capital for its own self-development and targeting that country and seeing that as an act of anti-Americanism. Cesar Chavez is hostile toward America. Noriega is hostile toward America. And what these leaders are doing is they again and again, each one of them again and again, make overtures. Milosevic made overtures. He gave away the, he gave away the store at, at Daytona at, to, to avoid war in Yugoslavia. Um, uh, Saddam Hussein tried to avoid war uh, and, and the like. They used some phony arguments about, oh, weapons of mass destruction hidden away somewhere. So, so that's what this book uh, is about and deals with. Um, <clears throat> the empire, the empire just grows I indefinitely and just and, and just keeps going. So, I also talk. I have a chapter in here about free market servitude. I have a chapter about globalization and a critique of Marxist writers. There are any number of Marxist writers, and I've never, I never critique Marxist writers. I never want to get in on the, on the um, sectarian, uh, uh, the, the, it, it's like the, um, what's the term I'm thinking about in religion? The, uh, what? No, no, the yeah, this guy, excuse me. Secular Marxism. Heretic. Theological. The theological squabbles, the splitting, the one-upsmanship, the splitting, the, you know, how many Marxists can you count on the head of a surplus value, you know, and all that, get into this thing. I, I mean, I don't, waste, I don't waste my time with those guys. I do not want to talk about it. But they, but they were going on globalization, and it was crazy. It was absurd. You can read it here. It's just, it's just a section of a chapter. Trying, I, it's called, the section is called Some Confused Marxists. I mean, they're absolutely confused. They just... It kept saying, what's all this fuss about globalization? They didn't understand what the battle was about. And they, and they all quoted the Communist Manifesto about Marx's favorite statement about capitalism goes into every corner of the world and remakes it in its own image. And it's, that, that globalization process has been going on all along. They didn't really understand what globalization really has become an issue. The kids out in the street who were fighting it in Seattle, I was with them. I remember being out in the street those those days. It, it was a great time. And, and fighting in where? Prague and in, in Torino and in uh, where else? All over, all over Europe. Uh, they understood what it was about. Globalization was the elevating of the property right above all other rights. All regulations, all tariffs, all protections for communal production, 
All of that was overruled and wiped away by the, these, glo these global treaties. And I, and I talk about it and how these Marxist guys, they would, they would write these articles, all of them saying the exact same thing and never once looking at the World Trade Organization, GATT, and all the other things that were actually happening. And see, it's like, it's like my theory's got this covered, so what do we have to worry about? And the trouble with some of those theorists is what? They don't know a goddamn thing about public policy. That, I mean, it's amazing yeah, sometimes when, when, when they come and say, oh, is that, I, whoa, wow. And, they, and they're all excited by something that's so obvious to some of us who know public policy. You should always know public policy and you should always know theory also because your policy, your understanding of policy should have a theoretical base and show you to be able to parse and organize your empirical stuff. And otherwise you just have hyperfactualism and you don't know, that you, then you're just some journalist who's turning out a little half story here and a half story there. And if you have theory, your theory needs to be anchored in, in actual history and actual politics. Otherwise, it just becomes this armchair, uh, self-referential kind of stuff where you get into debates with other theorists, you know, secondary and tertiary interpretations and, and, and uh, definitions of terms. So there's some of that in here. And the free market... Uh, <clears throat> servitude, the following chapter after that one, I, I look at a country that is a perfect example of the perfect free market, and that's Indonesia. I mean, Indonesia is really close to what the Republican right-wing maniacs in this country are dreaming of, and it's really terrific. Indonesia, you know, back in the early 60s under Sukarno, and the, and the Indonesian Communist Party was part of it, they were building libraries and schools and hospitals. That's all gone. You go to Jakarta now, there's not a single playground in the whole, in the whole city. Not a single playground. You've got kids playing on garbage dumps. You've got, you've got 200 mosques and more being built all the time, but not a single playground. You've got buses that go plunging off roads and breaking down. Almost every week a bus breakdown or a bus accident. Uh, because the buses are part of the public transit system that's falling apart. Or, or some of them are private buses and they just scalp and squeeze as much as they can out of a passenger. You've got, uh, <clears throat> you've got no uh, hospital care to speak of. You've got no housing programs. You've got, you've got, it, is a private, it is a perfectly privatized country. It is, it is carried out. Those who have money will get services. Those who don't have money will die young. And um, I use, I rely heavily, I mean, I cite him quite heavily, too, uh, uh, and, um, Andrei Vlitschik. Andrei Vlitschik is originally Eastern European, but he's a brilliant, a brilliant uh, analyst of uh, Oceania and Pacifica and the whole Southeast Pacific and such. And, he, and he's done a lot of stuff on, on uh, Indonesia and has lived there, too. Uh, so that, it's a good source. He, in fact, has now, since this came out, he, he wrote a nice endorsement on the back for this book. Um, he's writing a book on Indonesia now, which is, which is good. I'm glad he is doing that. So that's what the book is about. That's what this book is about. It's a way to try to make you see certain things. It points out that capitalism works very well for the capitalists, not for people. It, turn, it, it, it points out that capitalism doesn't work for humanity. And I can prove that to you in a few sentences. Capitalism is spreading all over the globe, and so is poverty. Capitalist Nigeria is getting poorer than ever. Capitalist Indonesia is getting poorer than ever. But the capitalists in Indonesia are very rich. They have small armies of maids and servants who they pay at subsistence slave wages, and they, and they do very well. And, and you can go on. Uh, the poor people in the world are increasing at a faster rate than the world's population. So poverty is spreading. It's spreading. Now, what does Libya teach us? I mention Libya in this book, but I don't say that much about it and, uh, because this book was in production and all before this 
this stuff started here. It came out in April. Um, Libya shows us just what I've been trying to say. Libya's sin was that it had charted a different course. It had a leader, dictator, as everyone called him. Nobody in the West, by the way. Now you tell me, in the last 20 years, how many of you read and heard Mubarak of Egypt described as a dictator? He was always President Mubarak. Wasn't that right? Right. That's right. President Mubarak. How many, how many here, here, here you describe the Saudi Arabian family as dictators? No. Saudi Arabia. Man, come on. Uh, I mean, Libya is like Athens compared to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's run, it's run by the Saudi family with their, with their uh, Wahhabi uh, fanatical uh, Islamics. Uh, who uh, you know will throw acid in a woman's face if it's uncovered and and, and creepos like that. Um, okay, so what what we had what we had in Libya is a humanitarian intervention. I'll end it right here, and and I hope if you read this book you could anticipate all of these things, sponsored by the UN, which becomes aerial and ground war against the existing government and the people. Even when the government, and this is what happened in Yugoslavia, which is in the book, and Iraq, even when the government calls, and Libya too it did, did it in about the second month, calls for ceasefire and offers to negotiate, the attacks continue. Because the goal is really not to come to a negotiated settlement. The goal is to unsettle. And so they bombed Libya for six months, just as they bombed Yugoslavia <clears throat> for two and a half months almost three months, two and a half months. The bombing is sponsored by the United Nations, not, I not the bombing of Iraq or, or Yugoslavia. With Yugoslavia, China and Russia vetoed it. This time, China and Russia, not that close or friendly with Libya, just abstained. So the UN, but even with the UN going in, the, the, the attacks in each of these cases is not carried out by the UN, it's carried out by NATO. And behind NATO, it's carried out essentially by the U.S. Um, and that means massive bombing, destruction of factories, utilities, ports, houses, hospitals, food supply depots, and the like. Drones, helicopter gunships, strafing civilians. The loss of life estimated 20, 30, 40 a day of Libyan civilians. Who were the civilians that the NATO forces were protecting. They came in to rescue them, but, they, but to save you, we had to blow you up and kill some of you. Uh, pretenses and lies about atrocities. I remember in the first week, somebody being interviewed, and I think it was on Amy Goodman too, and, she, and he said, yes, 10,000 have been slaughtered by Gaddafi. I, I, what, 10,000? The, the fight had just begun. These rebel, small rebel groups were here, but somehow Gaddafi had gone out there and he had killed 10,000 who? Where? What locales? For what motive? What, what, what were the disturbances that led them to do that? But these kind of things come up. What you do is you demonize the leader. You, whether it's a Milosevic or Noriega or Saddam Hussein, who was a butcher. Who, Saddam Hussein was a killer and a murderer and a torturer. But when he was doing that, they loved him in Washington. <laughs> they adored him. He was, he, was, he, was, he was a staunch ally. They loved him. It's when he got out of line on the oil quotas. That's when they started about. It's when he refused to privatize his economy. He kept it state run. And he started training Ira Iraqis in engineering and this and that and sending them abroad, men and women. It's when he kept some of the reforms that the previous democratic government had had. Remember, it was a democratic government back then. And when the US went in and said, we're going to teach these poor little Iraqi Iraqis what democracy is, teach them how to do democracy because they don't know. 5,000 years civilization, they don't know how to do democracy. The Americans, we know how to do democracy. <laughs> Look at our democracy, right? Isn't it great? I mean, don't you feel good? I mean, we, it's the most expensive democracy in the world. We spend, we spend uh, $20 billion every, every four years to elect a president. I mean, who, who wouldn't want to match that democracy? 
And then the role of the media, again so predictable. Massive demonization of the leader gives license to bomb his people. Um, but not concerned about democracy in Egypt. Not concerned about democracy in Saudi Arabia. See, this is, it's here. Let me go back to the first points of this talk. I'll be wrapping it up now. It's here that the liberal critics come in and say, you see how confused they are? They're going against Libya because it's not a democracy, but they're, they're giving aid to Saudi Arabia and to, and to the dictator Mubarak for 30 years in Egypt. How, how confused. They're not confused. You're confused, you stupid ass. They know which, guy, which democratically elected presidents are theirs and which ones are not that are really sincerely trying to make changes like Allende was doing and people like that. And those are the ones they target. And they know which dictators they like and support and work with and which ones they dislike. And so, and you can also see now death squads will be coming in as in Kosovo and as in Iraq. The IMF and the World Bank, which Gaddafi kept out of Libya for 40 years, they're already getting ready to come in. Foreign oil companies are coming in, but that was, that was going to happen anyway because Gaddafi, in the last seven or eight years, he saw what happened to Iraq and he started softening and making overtures and saying, okay, SAPs, you can bring them in. Structural adjustment programs, meaning cutting back on the social wage, um, letting private capital take over some of the oil companies and all that. He was, he was beginning to, but not enough. Not enough. He was not a real vassal state. He was not leaving that thing wide open. Uh, he was still had certain protections in there. And he also had abuses and the like, too. The goal is privatization, deregulate everything, everybody's poorer, everybody's weaker, uh, wipe out the social wage, that is the social services and the communal needs that are, are there. The potentially enemy state becomes a vassal state. And that's, that's some of the things, that's just some of the things that this book is about. I mean, was that an infomercial or wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much.